the transformer model is a model that also does sequence prediction, but it's a non recurrent <coughs> model. So we already knew from models like WaveNet and BiteNet that there were dual sequence prediction with dilated convolutions. So you didn't need the recurrence. You could simply, in every layer, look at all the words that came before. Or if it's an encoder, all the words left and right. So a transformer is a model that does that, but instead of convolutions, it uses this attention operation. So attention is, is an operation that does not have a separate weight for different positions. It has a, uh, it, uh, it attends to, to the words based on their vector representations. And in particular, uh, the attention is a very simple mathematical operation. So when you have queries, keys, and values, the attention of Q, K, and B is a softmax of Q matrix multiplied by Q transposed, and this softmax multiplied by B. So it's very nice that you can write it in one line, and you can start thinking, so what does that actually mean? And the way I think about it is as follows. Imagine you have a vector for your query. Then among the key vectors, you'll find the, you want to find the most similar key to your query. So that would be the key that's closest to you in cosine distance. And cosine distance, if the vectors were normalized, is calculated just by vector protocol. So Q key transposed, you can think of it as calculating the cosine distances between all vectors. Now, this would be assuming the vectors are normalized, but they're not. And that actually helps the softmax because this allows control the softmax temperature. So you do the softmax over this QK transposed on unnormalized vectors. And this tells you, okay, which of the keys were most similar to me. And from that, you retrieve the values, which you do by matrix multiplying with values. So it's a very different operation from convolution where you have a fixed set of positions, you know, current minus one, minus two, plus one, plus two, and you have a separate learnable weight for each convolution. In the attention operation and the kernel, you have no learnable weights. It's just this retrieval operation. But since you have some activations for, for every position, you will have a good old-fashioned feedforward layer to create the QK and V. So there will be three feedforward layers. They will create the QK and V, and you'll calculate attention on them. And it turns out this attention operation is better than, in, especially in the context of sequence learning, uh, than the convolutions. And on this translation uh, benchmarks, uh, English German was a, was a very old translation benchmark, and blue score is a way of measuring the quality. And 23, that was a fairly high number uh, achieved by Bytenet, which was a convolutional model. And then uh, the Google NMT system, a big RNN tuned with an addition of reinforcement learning of 24.6, which was considered like absolutely top what you, what you could achieve at that time. Um, and you could scale it up to 26 with mixtures of experts, but these were huge models. And it turned out you take a basic transformer and it gets 27, and then you take a big transformer and it gets 28, and then it gets 29. And by now, nobody's using this benchmark very much anymore because, because it, it, it's as good as saturated. OK, so transformers showed their power by solving this translation. But as time went on, we started thinking, oh, wait, you know, what is translation in principle in for transformers? If you take one sequence and generate another sequence, every problem can be described as taking one sequence and generating another sequence. OK, so, so it, it can solve all problems. And, and you may even think you actually don't need the other sequence, because if you can do long, like if you don't have a problem that, that the sequences need to be short, then you can just put a question and have a separator token and put the answer and treat it all as one sequence. So on this picture of transformers, you can basically skip this whole encoder part and just operate on the decoder. So if you, the encoder, the decoder, it's a very simple model to implement, a simple model to run. If you just scale it up and will it solve all tasks in the world? Well, it's doing not too bad. 
in the sense if you give it even data, for example, all images on the internet with some text that describes them, it can generalize to things like you'll say an illustration of a baby died with radish in a fruit walking dog, and it will generate you an image like the ones below, and it will generate it almost pixel by pixel. I think these are actually generated with patches, but, but these are fairly small patches. Then it generates the left topmost, then the next, then the next, then the next, then the next, and so on. And uh, as you probably know, these models give you a probability of what is the next patch or word or token. So you can sample from these probabilities, and that's how you get different images. And it's pretty clear that this distribution is, is very well, I mean, it, it, it's clearly semantic in the sense, you know, you have a dike of radish with dogs, right? The colors of the dogs change, but, but not the content. So, so that's quite impressive. And you can see it on images because, you know, images are really hard to fool once you generate things pixel by pixel because we are so used to images that we immediately see uh, when, when, they're, when they're off. Um, it, we can even learn to write on top of, like, <laughs> produce text on top of images even though these pixels are nowhere near. So, so it's, it's clear these models learn higher level concepts and, and, and can generate images. They, as they were designed to generate text, they can not only translate but also generate text from scratch. So GPT stands for, stands for Generalized Pre-trained Transformer, and it, it is a model from OpenAI that is a whole series of models. Actually, GPT-2 was uh, a few years ago. It could generate like quite meaningful paragraph apps or, or something on the order of, of three sentences. So the economist once made an interview. The question was by the humans, like how worried do you think you should be about machines taking our jobs? And the answer is from the model. And it is reasonable enough to publish in the newspaper. So, so when the model is trained on, this model was trained on the data from the internet, so basically a scrape of the, the I think a large part of the common crawl with some filtering. It still generates very reasonably looking text. It would fail in coherence if you tried for it to generate long text, but when you take GPT-3, which was the next model scaled up to 175 billion meters and a bit longer training, it would generate not just a coherent paragraph, but it generates can generate you like a whole coherent story. So this is GPT-3 being used in a game, and it starts with you arrive at a small wooden store which is in the window, and there is a whole dialogue, and, and there is a princess somewhere there, I think. Um, you play chess, and so you, know, you, you, you can tell what you're doing, the model will answer in kind, and, and it's reasonably good at it. In the sense that sometimes it can go a bit off the rails, but, but Generally, it, it can stay coherent for, for a long time. Okay, so we were like, hey, this is, I mean, this is almost AI. You can talk to the model. Uh, it will answer you reasonably. Uh, how did that happen? You know, what, what other than this simple transformer architecture do you need? And it turns out what you need is a lot of scale and, and compute. So, so you need to make the models big and train them for long, and you need to engineer and tune. And you know, since since the Transformers uh, paper in about 2017, there's been a lot of work to improve this model and add to add inductive biases to make it specialized for images or for sounds or for certain tasks to tweak the architecture. And very little of this work has has brought meaningful changes. So there are some small architecture tweaks that do help a little bit, like original transformers had ReLUs. Uh, nowadays, people use GelLUs or GameLUs, so you change the nonlinearity a little, it helps a bit. But there hasn't been anything big in the architecture that, that, that would bring like major improvements, which to me is very disappointing. I, I believe this is, this is something waiting to happen, but, but it's 
maybe needs more brutal uh, surgery of the architecture than what people have been willing to do. Um, but on the side of what worked, and, and this keeps being surprising in some sense, is that making the models bigger helps dramatically. So here's an example. If you train a about 20 million parameter model transformer on Wikipedia, and you give it just the title, you see the title of this to be Pescadores Weekly, it starts producing some text that is basically quite garbage. It says things like Pescadores is named after the Lord of the University of the Gravity of Drama, which makes no sense. Okay, you train on the same data a 300 million parameter model, and it starts making sense. It says like the Pescadores Weekly is the only daily newspaper in Fort Hood. This is true, but but it at least makes sense uh, as text. Um, and it, it even kind of knows like that John McCain is, is in the Republican Party, so it shows some level of knowledge of the world that it has acquired from the internet. And as you saw before, if you scale it to 100 million parameters, it's even better. And you may very reasonably ask, so, so how will this scaling work? Is, does it make even sense to scale it even further? And people ask this question. So in particular, you can compute the test loss. <coughs> Sorry. So you have a test set, and you can say, like, if I train really well a model of a certain size, and for this you need to know how to scale up the model and how to scale up the data, and so on and so forth. But if you do that, then, then on the log axis of the amount of compute you put into the model, the test loss seems to go down very linear. And, and as you can see, there were like a lot of runs, and there is a point in the run where, where you get the best efficiency, and, and basically, which is a good point to measure the loss. And if you take them, they, they, they form a very clean line. And this has been verified by a number of groups. A lot of people may not have, have tested this. The scaling laws are very good for two things. So for one, they're very good to convince people that they should pay money for scaling up. Because we show you, look, if you scale up, you scale up, we will be better, right? The loss will get go down. They also tell you what is irreducible loss. And, and, uh, so there should be some level under which you can't get an improvement in loss anymore. And, and as far as I know, all the groups that have tested it seem to get the result that the irreducible loss of language is zero, meaning that if you scale the models infinitely, you will have zero loss of language, which cannot be true because there is some randomness in the human language. So, so you know, it may point to uh, still certain flaws in, in, in this whole endeavor. But, uh, but it certainly proves that you can scale the model and get better loss. OK, it also shows you if you train a model, and, and it is not on this scaling curve, like the loss that you get is somewhere else, then it may tell you that you have bugs in your model. Because it's very hard to debug machine learning. But if you know what loss you should attain, then, then it's much easier to do that. And I think this has been the main use of the scaling loss, for me at least. OK, but so OK, we know we'll scale up models. We'll get better loss. That's amazing. So, so what will the models do? Because what this tells you is you'll get lower test loss, but, but what does that mean? Like, does this mean you'll ask the model to code and it will code for you? Well, to some extent. So, so we've trained and, and, and others, and many people have by now trained large language models on code, and uh, we've even logged something called Copilot together with GitHub, where you can write a function name or, or write a part of a function and the model will complete it for you. And it does a very reasonable job. So people use it, and it completes, and, and it's helpful. It by no means will you know, implement the whole program for you, but, but, but it helps. So if we, if we wanted to implement whole programs, one way to check if that would work would be to give the model a, a task. Like on the right side of the slide, you can see a simple task. Like write a function which takes an array of integers and returns a number of elements which has a sum of digits bigger than zero. If a number is negative, then its first same digit will be negative. So for example, minus 1 to 3 has digits minus 1 to 3. So the sum is 4. OK. 
So if you have an, an exercise like that, you would hope that the model will solve it. And can they? Well, at the beginning, if, if you take a look at these 100 million models, 1 billion parameter models, they're not that good at it. So they'll solve it maybe in 1% of the cases or 5% of the cases. But then a few interesting things happen. One is as you grow the model, they solve it in more and more percent of the cases. And the other thing that happens is if you give the models more tries, even the smaller models solve these tasks in larger and larger percent of the cases. So the fact that bigger models will solve more tasks was fairly predictable from the scaling loss. At least you would hope that this will happen. The second thing, I mean, it's very clear that if you give the model more attempts, then it will solve more tasks. But it is not clear that this thing would truly scale up. Because, you know, this uh, it could be that some hard tasks, it just never has the idea how to do this, and that it will never solve them, even if you give it a million or ten million. You know, if you put a parrot on your keyboard and it will type random letters, it will not solve your coding task in a million attempts. There is 15,000 vocabulary, so we're getting 10 tokens right is, is 50,000 to the power 10, and then that exceeds any amount of time and or, or resources you may want to invest in that. So, 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 so it should not happen that easily, uh, but and I find this is a beautiful result from the alpha code paper on the right here, you have the pass rate plot versus the sample budget. How many, so you sample 10 times, 100 times, and you just check whether any of these samples is a correct solution. And you can see that on the log scale again, this forms almost a straight line, with larger models being higher, but, but all of the models basically form a straight line. So, so there is this beautiful, another scaling law that says the more you sample, more uh, you can actually get solved. <clears throat> and, and it doesn't seem to stop anywhere near it. So, so, so this is uh, this plot is on a fairly intricate coding data set, including some problems that, that, that I would find non-trivial. And, and it reaches 50% where there are definitely, these are definitely not just basic problems, right? So, and I hope in the, in the earlier talk you, you've seen more examples. So, so, so it is amazing that the models can even generate solutions to this. And you're faced with the question, can you pick a solution? And how would you pick it? Well, in coding, you may have, for example, a few simple unit tests. If you have those, you can run them. Can that help pick a solution? Yes, dramatic. <clears throat> Even though, as you see, when, when you have millions and millions of solutions, it, 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 it starts, you need to start asking, is, is this the best method? But here is an example table. So a raw put set one or a raw pass set five is, if you just generate one solution, how many times does it pass? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so, so, so you can see that, for example, a raw pass at 100 means you just sample 100 solutions and 20% of them will pass the unit test. But you also have the filtered pass. So a filtered pass is you sample 1,000 solutions, but you only pick those that pass the, the three very basic tests that were there in, in, in the dog string or extracted from the dog string. And you see that already this is higher than the pass at 100. So, so even something that we consider very basic, meaning if you read the problem, run it on the test inputs that were provided and, and, and pick only those that work, gives a huge boost. So you may say, OK, it's great. This shows you can solve problems if you just generate a lot and, and pick those that pass unit tests. But it also makes me worry a little because if you say I can code, then you also imagine that if I write a code, I would be a little bit running it in my head and 
not writing things that, that flatly don't pass uh, the, the test that you've provided and that are in this dot stream that I've given. So, so it's a it's a great in the sense you know, you can make a system that works, but does it show that transformers can code or does it show that they actually can't code that well? That's something you know it's hard to tell, but, but, but good to think about. So now, how about code that you can't run? So if you have a coding class system like Copilot, you can't actually run the code because it may be producing code for a system someone's writing, like a mobile app that requires a virtual environment to run and, and a thousand imports, and, and you simply can't run it because maybe it connects to the internet and stuff and so on. So you, you don't have the privilege of running code or unit tests when, uh, in general, it, it's something you can only do for these tests and programming competitions. But you can still exploit the, the, this beautiful thing that, that more and more solutions are correct, because you can simply train a model that, that will determine is this answer correct or not. And so instead of training it from scratch, you basically take the transformer you have one layer on top that, that takes the representation vector and generates one number between zero and one, which is the probability that, that this whole code you've just generated is correct. And if you use that, so, so this is a paper that tested this on this human evil data set, and, and it shows that, that this ranking improves the, the number of passes, as you think. Uh, and, and we, we've seen that the, this is actually very applicable to, to many situations. So it doesn't work just for programming exercises. It also works, uh, for example, for uh, problems in mathematics where you just generate a solution. Ah, here is here is an example. So you, you could train a model for it, or you could even just ask the model to generate an answer. <clears throat> so, the answer can be something like 11, but it's actually, and that's another finding, complementary to, to the thing that you should use a verifier on top of what the model generated and ask is this correct or not. In addition to that, it seems to be very good to ask the model to provide a rational. Like, why have you, have you said that? And you can do that by giving the model one example that instead of just answering, it provides a rational. So, so here it's called chain of thought. So say you have a question where there has five tennis balls, he buys two, uh, more cans of tennis balls, he, each can has three balls, how many balls does he have now? You can ask the model just for an answer, but you can ask the model for, here is an explanation. Roger started with balls, two cans of three is six, five plus six is seven, that's and then when you ask the next question, the model will generate a reasoning like this too, and it can be right or it can be wrong. It will definitely not be right every time it tries to generate it. But if you put a verifier on top of that, together with this chain of thought prompting, you can get the model to solve many more cases correctly. And this holds, for example, for math problems. So this is from a paper about grade school maths. And the blue curve you can see is by model size and, oh, sorry, this is the large model. The blue curve is just having more data to fine tune on, while the orange curve is, uh, is, the, is using the verifier, and, and both of them are using this chain of thought method. And the, the nice thing is, like, if you combine this chain of thought to the verifier, you can get gains on problems like maths and, and code that go way beyond what just scaling models would bring to one itself. So, so these methods allow models to, like bigger models are still better, but these methods allow even smaller models to solve non-trivial problems, and the big models start problems that, that you call like really non-trivial interest. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so, so, so we have a we have a method for it, right? We train a very big model, sample a lot from it, then use a chain of thought in every loop something, run a verifier on top, 
there is an additional method recently introduced. So if you if you have say a thousand answers and, and some of them say eleven and some of them say nine, you can do just majority voting. Take take the take the answer that, that, that most of these uh, answers say so that would be consensus. If you have a long telling you how probable it thinks each of these answers is correct, then you can do a weighted consensus. And consensus is a particular case of something people long ago in machine learning called uh, minimum base risk decoding. So in minimum base risk decoding, it's something like where when you don't have an answer that's a single number, where you don't want to ch check for equality, but say in translation, you have a number of translations and you want to say, okay, which ones of those are actually correct? Well, probably no, no two translations are the same, but some can be very similar. So you can measure similarity by, by a metric like blue or, or, or just by one overlap or, or in any way. And then you can pick the consensus one, but by this similarity metric and not by strict equality. It's been called MBR decoding and used in other domains as well. So if you combine all these methods, you can get a system that's fairly strong at solving you know, things like programming exercises or math exercises. And this is very impressive because you know we know already these models can generate text that sounds reasonable. And now it seems they can generate text that not only sounds reasonable but actually makes sense once you, once you verify it. Um, so, so, so that's great, but, but here's a question, you know, we're coming back to the question we started this talk with. So this model gives you good code, and it even writes you like a reasoning that explains why this code is good. And, and maybe once in a few million samples, it can be like give you a correct solution of a hard problem, but it, it will point you to, to which it is because it has the, these mechanisms. If you have this model, would you say that it can fool? And, and you know, I'm not quite certain I would. It, 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 it does give impressive results, but is this what you call the ability to code? Is this, is this really what we want from our models, right? It's, it's impressive these models can do that. It's impressive we found the mechanisms to, to weed out correct and incorrect answers. But I mean, it, it, it's great we went through this stuff. We, we not, now know these language models can be tweaked to, to, to give answers that, that agree with the, the notion of correctness that, that, that we want. But is that, like, the, the question to me becomes is that what we want? Is that, is that a model that we will say, okay, it can code? Or, or, you know, or have we gone? far in this direction, but is it actually something else that we want? And if it's something else, then what do we actually want from a model that can code? Um, do we want it to be able to talk with us about the code? Do we want it to be able to run it and, and decide what next to do with it? Um, I, I, I think it's, it's very reached the point that we can ask these questions, but I also feel like it's, it's a great time place to, to start asking these questions more broadly because it, it's not like a single researcher can, can, can just answer this. I, I, I think as the community reaches this point where, where we know that these models work to a certain extent, we need to also start saying, okay, but, but th this is a limited kind of set of things that they can do, and what do we actually, like, maybe we need new evaluations, maybe we need new tasks for them to do. And I, I hope you know this is also a good place to stop for me and to uh, discuss it with everyone. You can discuss it here on chat or on the Slack. Um, but uh, yes, uh, I'm uh, I, I'm still here. I hope we leave, we leave a few minutes for discussion. Thank you very much.
model is going to primarily apply to the generation of code, like given an actual language prompt, create a program and then determine whether that program is correct. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts, especially in terms of what it means to be able to code, if program comprehension is something that you consider either training or evaluating model. Say, given a program, tell me if what it evaluates to, or if it satisfies some higher level criterion of expected program behavior. Uh, have you seen any interest in work in that direction? Is it something that we're incorporating into your work? Or more broadly, do you think it would be useful to just have compre uh, comprehension as a portion of how we train or evaluate these models? Yes, yes, definitely. So, so we looked at a number of benchmarks. Um, so you can, uh, in addition to just generate code, you can say, OK, document this code. And say, fix this code. You can say that, that there is a whole suite of code evaluation, which I, I, I think there is also a talk uh, about that uh, coming soon. But we, we actually ran the whole suite, like 30, 50 or 60 different eval tasks. And the models are better at some and worse at others. For example, actually running the program with the model as an interpreter is one of the weakest points of the models that we find. But it gets better if you find you on, on this kind of task as well. Um, but in general, the, the big first order picture, if you take a whole family of models with different sizes and different data and so on, is that in the first order, all of these tasks are extremely correlated. So the models that do best on producing code also tend to do best on explaining it, and they also tend to do best on, on running it and, and all kinds of evaluations. So, so while we are not, like yes, we are after other things, it seems like on all of these evolves, the, the better your model gets in, in one, the better it seems to get in the others. And, and and they get like models now the copilot even has a has a, the copilot plugin has an extra button that will explain the code for you so it's not something that you can do. Running code slowly works in simpler simpler cases, but but it's starting to work as well. So I'm quite optimistic as for will these models be able to, to do other evaluations? Probably yes. Um, I I still think they on necessity, all of our evals are very single function in beasts, right? There's a, a small group of code or text and it gets intertwined and, and the model seems to do that, but, but are they really good on like real programming is, is a tougher question. that one of the tests for actually learning to program is um, can you pick up a new language quickly and uh, write for it. So on that note, do you uh, see transformers working out for languages for which there isn't a lot of existing data on GitHub already? Like I'm thinking, you know, some new language that somebody has come up with or even let's say Haskell for which there isn't a huge amount of code. Yes, we, we inadvertently made the natural experiment once. So we wanted to train a Python-only model, and, and some languages, and people were, oh, but it's very good on Rust. We were like, we thought we didn't train on any Rust. <laughs> it just snuck in. So, so it's still generalized for well. But, you know, the languages are, are fairly similar. Um, but yes, like we, the, the recent ones are not new ones. So, but we, yes, it can do Haskell. It, it, it's, uh, I mean, is it good? It's harder to say. But, but, but it definitely has to large extent generalize. So on that note, I think some public data on uh, how well this sort of technique works for languages like Haskell, I think that would be really helpful for the scale community. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> if you are, uh, uh, if it's possible to release that sort of some information about um, that, that would be, I think, very helpful. I, I, it would be great if we had evils that, that are in Haskell. Actually, yeah. Uh, I have a question. 
you mentioned um, earlier about how difficult it is to improve transformers by adding them to name knowledge or um, by improving the architecture. Um, do you have any sense of why that is? Uh, not yet, to be honest. I, 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 it's definitely one of my dreams to, 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 to be like, I, I do believe that, that there is a major improvement to transformers that, that, that can happen. It's a belief, but not a, it's not a, you know, maybe a false belief, <laughs> pretty much, I do not believe, but uh, it may be that, that transformers were co-evolved with hardware, right? One of the goals when they were created was to name them faster by making the model less recurrent, so more suited to, to the current hardware, which are very parallel. The brain isn't parallel, right? It operates at batch size one in Go. Um, so it may be that we're in a, in a hardware software optimum that, that is a local optimum that kind of makes it harder to, to get out of it. Um, but it may also be that we just need more ideas for time. I, I don't know, but it has proven hard. It's not like there are no gains, but the gains are not as big as we would hope that we would change our architecture. Okay, let's thank you This time, it's just going to work. Place it there, you pull. Oh, I thought there wasn't any good things to go wrong that time. <laughs> <laughs> one more. We've added one to the list. <laughs> during the next talk, right? Five minutes left.
If you want to give it a try, you can just step under the circle and then share your screen. 